So welcome everyone. Um, this is exciting. We are in the last principle, the last two weeks of the seventh principle, this one on equity. It's been a long and winding journey and we are uh, heading into the home stretch, obviously. And uh, it's great to see so many new faces to join us on this really important conversation and uh, looking forward to uh, beginning our, our interrogation of the equity principle, which for those of you who haven't joined us in the past, um, this is kind of our rhythm to this work. We take the first of the two weeks to, to kind of go more deeply into the principle itself. And then the second of the two weeks, we look at strategies to begin to think about implementing um, what we feel the principle represents and how we want to live that in, in our school. So this is the first week of our discussion and um, Homa is going to lead us through that. I was just reminded really quickly um, earlier that is this the third anniversary of our of our uh, our presentations at the UN? For those of you who who happen to be there, this is kind of a memorable day for <laughs> Homa and me um, trying to take uh, 20 minute presentations and condense them into about eight minutes in the uh, in the grand hall at the UN. Uh, certainly one of our fondest memories. So if any of you were there, you remember the, <laughs> the kind of chaos of that moment. But um, hopefully today will be a lot smoother. And uh, it, the sooner I stop talking, the, the, the more quickly Homa can feel relaxed about the time she has today. So I'm going to hand it over to Homa right now. And I um, uh, just want to say welcome again to all of you. Thanks, Will. Um, I am so delighted to see so many, we have a lot of new faces and all of you really represent an incredible uh, brain trust and work trust, um, an incredible um, group of people who have been really dedicated to the principle of equity, um, which we're focused on today. So I'm gonna share my screen and, um, sorry, let me, uh, put this in the proper mode. I'm not usually the screen sharer on these. Um, okay. Yay. So here we are. Um, so this is a little rundown on how we do this. And I want to, you know, kind of in the spirit of, of never <laughs> of that UN gathering that, that condensed our, our speaking time. This is such an important topic this is not a training on equity. This is not a, uh, you know, this is not an educational workshop. We are really hoping my purpose in a few minutes right now is to tee up a conversation that is around making meaning on the principle that this group, which sort of was an open door for anyone to join that spontaneously sort of came together um, since the pandemic to rethink um, what school might be, um, sort of landed on seven principles. And then the seventh one, we've gone through adaptive change, capacity, learning, community, wellness, evidence, and now equity. And I'm gonna read the equity principle because I find um, these are very powerful ideas that again, this was a co-created, process of many of the people who are in this Zoom room right now and some that may not have been able to join us today. But the idea of we commit to, and so this was written by uh, many of the leaders in AIE, we commit to identify, confront, and dismantle structures and systems of inequity to examine our privilege and take actions to increase justice and belonging. So it's a lot. And I, I love to lay, set the table because I think amidst all of these big ideas, um, and this was a, in a really powerful conversation that the curators um, and I, Emily, Anna and Joel and I had yesterday, and we'll talk about that process later, um, but underlying, there are so many qualities that are underlying this work and love is probably, it's the most powerful one. And so this quote, I love this quote from James Baldwin. He says, if I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. 
And so part of this work is a process of making conscious. It is founded on so many levels of love. And so it is a process of making us conscious of these things that are around us and that we need to work to see. And so, um, and this is something, um, again, with the, with the curators yesterday, we talked about the importance of courage. When we look at the words that are in this principle, um, how crucial to every step, um, identifying, dismantling, examining, taking action, all of this takes courage. And so just to kind of start to think about what this means to us, because this week is about meaning making, to please in the chat, we can just share a word or two or whatever moves you, what gives you courage? And to consider when is a time that you were alone in your conviction and you were courageous in light of that, or maybe you felt alone. So just share, um, thoughts that come to mind on this to kind of start to put us in that courageous space. Um, and I'm not sure if I can actually see what comes through the chat right now, the way I have this set up, but um, we'll just take a few seconds quietly to think about this. It's a hard question. It takes courage, I think, to even share that. Um, injustice, our children. Hmm. Um, there are some beautiful themes that are coming through in the chat, and I, I decided to not read them because I think they speak for themselves. And yeah, beautiful. <clears throat> so I think, you know, one thing that comes through is that it's sort of, there is a lot of work to be done, and it's a lot of inner work as much as it is institutional work. And that's very much reflected in the principle. Um, so in terms of kind of making some sense of this, and please continue as ideas come to you about courage, or if you want to respond to the chat, we usually have a very robust chat and, and I really appreciate all of the sharing and thoughtfulness here. So I um, want to talk a little bit, uh, want to get a little meta here on I am focused in my work more in the area of racial literacy, global literacy, cultural competence. There are also versions of what I'm about to show you in terms of, of gender, in terms of many other intersectionalities of identity. So I don't want this to come across as sort of single uh, focus, but especially in the, in the interest of time, I am going to focus a little more on racial literacy here. Um, and the idea why this is important is this idea that Howard Stevenson conveyed. By practicing racial literacy, we can learn to not be so fearful and problem solve together rather than run away from conversations about race, rather than run away from discomfort. And so what you see here is a heat index. This is not, it's more like a thermometer. It's not like a number line of words that grow in magnitude, but it's words that grow in heat. And so it's been really helpful to recognize as we embark on this work, as we make meaning of structures and systems, as well as personal privilege, to think about what the power of the words is, what the power, the, the heat, that may rise in the, war, in the room as you move up this index. So for example, using words like harmony and oneness, 
easy. We're very comfortable to kind of stay inclusion, even diversity, very comfortable to stay there. Let's talk about safe spaces. That's pretty cool. But as you move up that heat index and you start to talk about anti-Blackness, white fragility, white privilege, white supremacy, and recently we added the word abolish to this heat index in terms of the conversation, abolish the police, abolish prisons. And what we found is that when you use these words, this metacognition of the heat allows you to stay in the room, listen when it is hard, and then clarify terminology even as the heat rises. So when we use a word like abolish, staying in the room, listening when it's hard and clarifying for some, you know, this is a very divisive term. When people have a chance to talk about it, um, you know, one person may think of, um, you know, what I mean by abolishing the police is the need to um, have social services in place, have um, supports. People who want to support the police may have a lot of agreement with that. And so sitting in the room and working through these sort of hot terms is really helpful. And it's a source of, it, it's become a source of courage for people who are sort of entering this work and have not been using this language as much. And so, you know, we, and then there are terms that are on the cool side that may be rather deceptive, like diversity. So in the principle of equity, an idea is that we want to move beyond just that presence of sort of bodies in a space. Diversity itself is not a clear indication of the presence of justice. Diversity is deceptive when it is divorced from real relationship. This next slide I'm going to show is a little tough. I just want to give a little warning. It's a little tough for some people to see. Um, but it is this idea that um, Eric Dozier talks about a lot that, you know, the plantation was diverse. There were diverse bodies in a space, but that is not an indication of justice. And the modern example of that is what we've been seeing this big sort of groundswell of voices of students that are telling, you know, there may have been diverse bodies in our school, but I never felt like I belonged. I never felt like I was welcome. And this has become a huge um, story, not just in US elite private schools, but now we're seeing it across the board in public schools, in all kinds of schools and in international schools. And so here are a couple of, of examples of the Instagram accounts of students in international schools, black and international schools, decolonizing international schools, that these voices really can be seen as data points. All of these stories are our data. And so we may go out and want to, um, you know, study this issue further. And I think it's very powerful to start with listening. Um, and we can't talk about the equity principle without sort of diving a little bit into this word equity. And so this is a very commonly shared, probably everyone in this room has seen this slide. Here's the difference between equality and equity. And this has been really helpful for a lot of people. Um, it also is limited. It's also somewhat flawed. And so as we embark on this commitment to an equity principle, it really behooves us to go deeper and examine. And, and just because the time is short, I'm just going to say a few thoughts about this. I would rather if we had time to really have everybody speak up and share what you're seeing. But, you know, this is a good beginning. Um, and, you know, there are a number of flaws even in the view of equity. For example, um, the solution in equity is basically the same for everyone, just on different orders of magnitude. Those crates, that's the solution. It works in a, in a, pict in a pictograph, but not necessarily in real life. Um, another aspect that I think really applies to our international schools is that wall. And this idea of sort of exclusion, gatekeepers, um, 
that that wall is a given, that that wall must always be there. And so if in our frame of dismantling and interrogating and rethinking what these structures might be, I think we also have to rethink the wall and the crates, the solution and, um, and, and the idea of a wall at many different levels in terms of power, leadership, privilege, curriculum, language, recruitment. I mean, there are so many places where that is manifest. This is a little bit better of a graphic in terms of equity and equality. I'm sure that our students could come up with even more accurate depictions, but this idea, for example, of infrastructure, community resources does not have to go out, you know, in two identical sort of pipelines, but there are different pipelines addressing different needs in our community and really seeing it as a frame for addressing our community. So um, I really quick, um, I think it's also important to consider what inclusion means to us on a deeper level. And so we hear about, you know, diversity is being invited to the dance, inclusion is being asked to dance. I don't love that. Who's, who gets to, you know, set the, the music? Who got to decide that it's a dance? I, there the couple other metaphors I prefer, and I'll just tell you about the gardening metaphor of if diversity is indicative of the quantity and the variety of the seeds, inclusion is like the quality of the soil. What is the quality of that soil that allows those seeds to flourish? And I think ultimately that is our work the conditions for bringing our whole selves, the conditions that allow that seed, all those different seeds to really flourish. That's, that's part of our role is that sort of gardening role, that nurturing and creating conditions. So um, if we wanna think about this, the um, frame, the principle talks on both a systemic and structural level, as well as on a micro personal privilege belonging level. And a really important idea, I think for leaders, and we are not gonna even skim the surface, but a couple ideas to share of some research in terms of how we make the case for people who have not been engaging in these conversations. One is this study from Google, which I love to cite. Um, the idea that they did this five-year internal study of what contributed to innovation the most within their organization. And they found that more than any training, any coding, any physical environment, any material incentives, it was psychological safety. More than anything else, you get innovation, you unlock thinking when people believe truly that they belong at the table, that they are heard that their ideas will be welcomed, that their whole self, who they are, that intersectional reality that we all bring is welcome to the table. So that making the case that this picture we are creating of equity is so linked to learning and innovation as we enter this new era is vital. Another thing sort of from a macro level, this book, Why Nations Fail, from two MIT economists came out years ago, but it's recently been revived in light of January 6th in the US, in, the, in light of the insurrection. And there has been discussion that the analysis is that there, the key to success on a macro level is the difference between inclusive institutions and extractive institutions or inclusive economies or inclusive schools, we could say. So an inclusive school incur or an inclusive institution encourages investment in new skills. It's open to new approaches. Power is distribu distributed. People are heard. In an extractive situation, resources are really held by the elites. There is not that sense of belonging and openness to change. There is a concentration. And so this is an analysis for nations, but I think that it applies to communities 
and it definitely applies to our international schools. So um, just kind of to help us think about, you know, there are so many ways, and, and this is again, skimming the surface to make a case for inclusive versus exclusive, inclusive versus extractive, um, equitable versus exclusive. So what might that look like? So these are sort of two big questions for us and I'm gonna open it up um, and I'll stop the share so we can have just an open discussion. And again, I am so sorry to just, you know, speak for these minutes, but um, we're trying to work within this frame that we have. Um, so the question, how might we confront and overcome the hard reality that many of our schools were established as and supported as havens for privilege? Like, we have to say it, it's uncomfortable, sit with that heat. Um, and then how can this community, this discussion, this new school project, these leaders of international schools, how can this community leverage its collective will to actually do the work of dismantling inequitable structures? And there is so much power in coming together, in leveraging um, this brain and action trust. Um, so just wanna open it here and we have a little bit of time for discussion and then we're gonna go into breakout rooms um, for small groups to work on the, the framework of breaking down the principle and then looking at um, what is working and what, uh, what hinders and what is um, allowing us to move forward. So um, I will allow for, I will pause here. Any thoughts, any thoughts on anything that's been shared so far? And maybe Will, if you see hands up, please sure. go ahead. Yeah, I can, I can moderate, but, uh, Thanks. or you can just go ahead and take the mic. Yeah, we welcome you to go ahead and take the mic. And Abhinav, thank you for um, putting that question in the chat. I can, I have a thought. <laughs> hey, Alyssa, hey. yes, hi, welcome. Hi, it's good to see you. You too. Um, a little intimidating because 38 people, but um, I do just something I've been sitting with because um, that question is is kind of like the frame of, of some of the research that I'm doing my, in my doctoral program right now, like to what extent can these spaces that incubate privilege, that are designed to maintain privilege, that are designed out of systems of oppression, can they be reformed? Um, and I don't know the answer, but I do think part of what I've been exploring and part of what I've been sitting with and just de deepening my thinking around is, is intersectionality and, and really trying to ask, like, to what extent can a school be anti-racist when it costs 40K a year, right? And so we are limiting, we're essentially creating spaces that are for a very, very specific population. And so I don't necessarily have the answers to that, but I do think that thinking about the intersects of colonialism, classism, um, decolonizing our spaces, like it's hard for me to look at a space and say, this is an anti-racist community, or this is a fully equitable community because they have a few webinars and they've built a DEI committee and they've maybe hired a DEI person, but the community still remains only accessible to the folks who can afford 40K a year tuition. And so I think thinking about where all of the different systems of oppression intersect and really learning from the concept of intersectionality and the work of Kimberly Crenshaw and thinking about how that helps us frame our approach to justice has been um, important reading and research for me, uh, which isn't, I don't, that that's not necessarily an answer, but just something that I've been sitting yeah. with and thinking about a lot is just how do we invite intersectionality into these conversations? Thank you. That's very important. Thank you. Alyssa, can you say just a little bit more about how you see intersectionality helping to sort of dismantle some of this notion of privilege? Yeah, I think, um, 
I think it's just important to just acknowledge that oppressions can be compounded, right? That's the framework, that's the basic tenet of intersectionality. And so, um, and that also when we don't acknowledge intersectionality, we end up having conversations about justice in silos that keep us from truly understanding it like at its, you know, not, I'm not, <laughs> not I'm not religious anymore but I grew up very religious and I come back I grew up in the church and I come back to this like biblical verse of like the least of these the least of those and like what it meant to like who Christ as a biblical figure was was like understanding and empathizing with those um in positions of compressed or of compounded oppression and I don't think we can be radically dreaming and truly innovating about truly truly liberated humane just spaces if we have those if we don't have those perspectives right because even um if we have these conversations but we're limiting the perspectives of those who have these compounded oppressions because they're, they're there's all of these different systems of oppression that they combat that come from capitalism or that come from uh, classism that we we're not talking about because their schools are really expensive um, i think it's just limiting our creativity and so for me intersectionality just opens up more creative, more radical dreaming. Um, and and like I said, I don't know what that looks like, right? What does that look like in practice? Is these, is it scholarship programs? Is it just having really critical conversations about why these schools cost so much? Is it, you know, I think that there's a lot of different pathways to justice, but I do think that intersectionality allows for a more creative conversation, right? Because we're introducing more perspectives into the into the conversation. I don't know if that answers Thanks. your question. Yeah, no, no, that was helpful. Thanks. Great. I like that you brought intersectionality to a whole new level, Lista, which really has to do with uh, the multiple systems. And I think, you know, in Homa, your idea of the soil brings that ecosystem to mind. It's why MIT is working on post-capitalism structures, because the intersectionalities are quite um, uh, dimensional when it comes to uh, society and how we've grown. And so the soil works as a metaphor, but then how do we look at all those structures like the MIT Strategy Lab is doing for new ways of sharing our earth and sharing our um, equity and inclusion for all? Love that you brought that into the room, Maddie. Thank you. Yeah. May I? Um, yes, thank you. Welcome. Hello. So I, I grew up going to an international school myself and I've done research on international schools and some of the things that sort of the ideas that I, you know, came across that I, I thought about was what, what is that in international schools or just life in general. It's like we have, we don't see the historical legacy or the continuum from colonial days to now and how our systems today is built on that. And that's just not acknowledged enough. Um, in international schools as well, in terms of the curriculum and so on and so forth. And it's almost as if today's world and our problems today, there's like this clean break with colonial days, right? And so that needs to, I feel like it needs to be verbally acknowledged in the curriculum and so on. And also acknowledge the privilege. We never talk about it. You know, it's always, we're so international, we're so international. We just never ever talk about the privilege, even though we know that we are privileged. And the other thing is, um, Alyssa, thanks so much for mentioning like intersectionality and stuff. Um, the scholarship, uh, I know a school that is doing that scholarship thing where you bring in students from uh, the local schools uh, to the international school who can't afford it. And I am not entirely sure that's the best system because what you do is you bring a disadvantaged kid into a school and they can't socialize with the other kids because of, you know, they can't go to the cafe, they can't afford all of these things. And I think uh, academic wise, I think it's a great idea, but psychologically, I'm not entirely sure. But I think you, you could have, you know, like the international school where I was doing research, they had a local school just down the street within walking distance, like 100, 200 meters. Uh, and it was a private school. so. You know, the students weren't necessarily from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds, but there were uh, in Indonesians and there was just absolutely no interaction. But I think if you get kids to interact with other kids who 
might not be completely, you know, be able to afford 40K, but have the kind of education that where they've got similar interests and stuff, you can start to build that, um, you know, these are not just Indonesians that we have to help out in, you know, the poor charity sort of mentality, but actually as an equal uh, in terms of thinking. And I think we could start from there, I feel. That's just some ideas, yeah. Those are really important points. And I think many people from different schools will relate to both those examples of what happens with the scholarship students and what happens to the sort of charity case school down the street. And both of those messages um, in and of themselves as good intentions from the school, uh, you know, looking at them in 2020, we know we have to build something much we are trying to build something that has never been built before. That's what we need to do. And that's what a lot of this project is about. Thank you for bringing those examples up. Art, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, just a little follow-up to, to the previous part of the conversation and, 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 and maybe a little provocation. What if we stop thinking about our schools as a physical space? What if we leverage the power of technology, like all of us have now learned to do in the past nine months. And if these kids can have a teacher that is located in, even on a different continent, but they all share a classroom like we're doing here now virtually, um, even if that's just one block or what 45 minutes a week, that would already go a long way. And then they don't there's no differences. You've all got a little square on the screen. And it's really who you are and what you do that you contribute. So just a, a little provocation there. Thank you. Can I speak? It's okay. I love that, Bart. I thought that was awesome. I love that. I love the now. I loved your thinking also. I love everybody. It's great. It's amazing this morning. Um, I would um, want to share that uh, working with a school in a school to school partnership in Kingston, Jamaica. What we've done over the years is invite the local Jamaica College to come over and participate in the professional learning that we're giving. So we're also trying to give back to them and have them sit at the table with us. It's just another idea, inviting the other schools to join in in that training, just throwing that out there. I love what's going on here, it's amazing. I wanted to share too, just on Bart's idea and what Anna has said that our NISA forums uh, in the principal sections, they're really interested in working on this together because they're interested in that continuum, Homa, you talked about and going from a safe, psychologically safe space uh, um, to you know letting the heat go up, but doing it in a facilitated way where they feel un, um, ill prepared for it. So they would like some help in moving there as school systems and, th and that, I'd love anything you'd have to say about application from the conceptual to the programmatic. That's what our school leaders are wanting. So um, what we've learned in this process is that if we can um, have breakouts right about now, then we will hear from many more voices. And so we wanna move into the breakouts and um, let me quickly, I don't quickly share my screen, so that's kind of a, let me see if I can, oh, there, okay. Um, so here's what we wanna do in our breakouts, because I think all of this is really leading us into, um, into the natural next st stage of the conversation. So um, the question is around the principle, and you will see it on, Sorry, it's not advancing. Why is this not advancing? Um, okay. Um, the question of what blocks us and what enables us. And so if you go to bit.ly backslash A-A-I-E-N-S for new school four, and maybe if somebody rapidly can type that in the chat, you can go right there bit.ly AIENS4, you will be in breakout rooms. And so if you're in group number one, you're gonna go to page number one. If you're in group number two, page number two, group number five, page number five. And the, the idea is to first think 
for yourself, a little quiet reflection. What do you need or want to do to advance the equity principle? What does it mean to you? What are, what are your own thoughts? And then in the group to discuss and capture thoughts about the equity principle in terms of what blocks us, and you'll see a breakdown of the language of the principle, what blocks us and what enables us to get there. Um, so Will is going to put you in the groups, but before you go, are there any questions? All right, <clears throat> so I'm gonna send you off. Um, Homa, what are we, uh, like 12 minutes or so, you think? Or yeah, we... sorry, it's not. All right, we'll go, we'll go until 10 of, we'll go until 10 of, and then we'll pull you back in, okay? All right, here you go, have fun. Welcome back, everyone. Was that frustrating or what? I'm sure everybody <laughs> was really getting going. Very. And that is the physics of the breakout room. You are mm. getting going and it's time to come back. So I know there was a lot of a lot of really great thinking in all the rooms. So would anyone care to share any sort of aha moment realization at any level? Love to hear. I, I want to share, I, I want to share because I think um, Tim started saying something in our group and and it just got me thinking like, oh my goodness. and I don't know if this is what you meant, so, so chime in. Uh, but he's, he, we, we were talking about how we, um, we do some things to um, appear like we are inclusive in schools. And so these, these, um, we don't even call them band-aids because we're not thinking that they're band-aids. We're really proud of these things that we do. And so we put them on a list. That is such a big barrier to moving forward because we say, yep, we have the diverse numbers, right? We have, we, we, we map and we're really proud to map that, um, you know, all of us have some kind of graphic that shows all of our nationalities, check. And our accreditation agencies say, check. Um, you're there. We, uh, we have scholarships. We also say that our scholarships are for our faculty members. So yep, check, we do our scholarships. We have a, a program for community service, check. So there are these, these actions that we take that, um, that make us as schools say, yep, we're doing this. And so that in itself, it puts us in a place of not moving forward. So I don't know, Tim, if that's where you were going to, but I started that, that, that conversation at the end. And I thought that was, that was really, really, really interesting of our actions and how we lie to ourselves. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, it's sort of tokens to assuage our guilt. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And that reminds me, Paula, of the um, heat index that Homa showed us at the beginning where you know, we like to stay in that, on the sort of cool range where we talk about diversity and inclusion and those propping up those types of programs or, or you know, as our model of diversity allows us to stay really comfortable. Um, so one of the things our group talked about as, a, as um, blocking us from moving forward is that fear and discomfort with change, with acknowledging privilege, with the difficult conversations um, to possibly giving up some privilege. And um, yeah, so it's, it's that fear that really holds us back, which also reminds me of what Homa said at the beginning about courage. <laughs> Jacinta, do I see you coming forward to unmute your mic? <laughs> I wasn't, I was leaning in to listen, but I can share some things um, from our group. Uh, we talked a bit about curriculum, but we also talked about this idea of the archetype of an international school educator and an international school leader and how those profiles automatically exclude people, right? You have to have X amount of years as a head of school or as a leader in an international school to be a head of school. But if we're in an environment that has historically excluded women, people of color, people that are not from the big five, um, we are limiting their access and opportunity to get into leadership positions 
in international schools to be curriculum leaders, to be principals, to be heads of schools. And we really need to think about how are we recruiting? Um, what are our competencies that we're recruiting on versus the profile of an international school leader and expanding that definition because a person like me has historically been excluded from the international school community. So it's going to be hard for me to fit the profile to even get in, to get a position in leadership, et cetera. So really thinking about that from a broader level and focusing on the skills that people have and not necessarily the experience that they have within the community. And can I just add to that? Um, like uh, when I was doing research, you know, the leadership was all like white, five white men. And when I said, you know, how come it's like, you know, not diverse and the immediate response was, you know, are you saying that we should hire people who are not competent? Um, and so there's this assumption that if you're going to make it diverse, then we are, it's, you know, affirmative action, hiring people who are not competent just because to make it, you know, a bit more diverse. But that's sort of not the issue because among those five, one of them was quite, you know, just made inappropriate jokes about female students to parents. And I was just a bit like, what? And then later on find out that this is, was, it was a pattern. And, but he got promoted afterwards from vice principal to principalship. Uh, and I thought, what? But then two, three years later, he got pretty much driven out of the school because people didn't like him. Like he just wasn't a very good leader. And so that's sort of the pattern where, where when we're not aware of the discrimination we're doing in the hiring practices, we end up with incompetent people just because they fit the model. Um, yeah, so. We have a couple more minutes if anyone would like to take the mic. I'll chime in here and just say that I'm thrilled to be part of all of these conversations, but I think this one in particular, um, and in some ways, um, in many ways, I feel like this is the principle. Um, so we've talked about how all of our principles need to be viewed in the collective and in their entirety, um, but this is absolutely fundamental and essential work. And I think um, one of the things I was talking about with my group was um, how accreditation, um, the, the phrase that we've been turning to throughout this has been that accreditation can be and needs to be a lever for change um, and this area in particular. Um, and so we're, we're diving in, in in several different ways about what that looks like and what that means. Um, but a, a, one of the things that has um, helped me is, and I, I never know who to attribute this to, but I always attribute it to uh, Steve Clem, who um, was active in the Association of Independent Schools in New England, the leader there for many years. And he always used to say, um, with regard to schools, it's okay to be where you are, but it's not okay to stay there. And so I think that provides a really powerful frame for a lot of what we've been talking about today around identifying and, and confronting truths and structures, um, and then using that as a starting point for, for making progress. Thanks. Um, I, I wonder if uh, Tawana, would you feel comfortable speaking to this really important comment that you just shared? Sure. I agree, I Tawana. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just noticed that gets um, said a lot in these kind of spaces, and I just wanted to point out it's not that we need mentoring necessarily, but we just need to have access and opportunity, and we need for people who are in those positions to be um, engaging in that work with us and understanding their power and privilege and their blind spots or things that they might not even be consciously aware of. And so I feel like having more conversations like this is opening that up. And I'm hoping that leaders or people who are in those, posi those positions to hire people are um, working to dismantle all of those things. So yeah, I think that, yeah, sure, everybody needs mentoring, that's great. But I just feel like a lot of times when I'm in these meetings, I see that particular thing all the time. And uh, there's a lot of people um, from diverse backgrounds who, has, who have just as much education 
and knowledge and things to contribute as people who don't look like us. So that was all I wanted to say about that. <laughs> really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I don't know, Mark, do you need to close this room at nine? Can we take one more, one or two more comments or I know we have a hard stop. Mark, you're, on mute. you're on mute, Mark. Yep. I'm definitely not going to be one to stop this conversation. So take it as you see fit, Oma. Okay, we often have a very hard stop, but uh, Anna, I see your hand up, please. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. So I guess I put out mentoring. I, I Like we try, we have made an active um, advance in our recruitment and hiring and gone into New York City to try to bring people of all different backgrounds to come upstate New York. And they think it's like we're, they're moving somewhere way out of this universe, you know? And so with the mentoring piece, I'm thinking that in recruitment, it's really that they, we have to figure out a way to also show people what it is. Like they have to have an introduction into this work. It's very different in the international schools. It's a different way of life than a public school in America per se. And so it's really, I think, that's part of what I'm thinking of mentoring is bringing people into that so that they, they kind of have that bridge. There needs to be a bridge of some sort. It doesn't exist, I don't think, right now. So I just wanted to put that out there. I'm not being very clear this morning, but I just wanted to put that out. Thanks. That's okay, thanks. And I, Dana, thank you for all your contributions uh, always in the chat. I know you have to go. Uh, anybody would like to take any other comments? Can I add one thing super quickly? I, yeah. I know we're wait, we're already at 901. Just in any of these spaces, as we continue to, to come together as an international community and talk about this work, I always wanna caution in something that I've been sitting with is, there's not a checklist for this and we have to kind of be very cautious of like schools wanting the checklist of when I've done A, B, C, and D. Now I have a more liberated space. Now I have a more just space. Um, and I think that we have to, you know, myself included, look at how am I being more intentional in this work about creating systems of accountability because we're gonna go in this work and we're gonna grow and we're gonna make mistakes and I'm gonna cause harm and I need to be held accountable for repairing harm. I need to be accountable for moving closer to justice and not letting that be like, oh, well, now I stop. <laughs> um, and I just think it's always good to, to just name that as we talk about equity, we talk about justice, we talk about humanity, we talk about liberation, there's simply not a checklist um, to this work and so we, you know, how do we build the systems and structures and the human capacity and the accountability to continue in the work even when it gets messy is, is my thought. So thank you, that's so important. I always think about um, there's no microwavable solution to this. This is not, there. we can't do that, unfortunately. And I see um, Abena, I think, uh, do, do you have your hand up? And then maybe we'll make yours the last comment if that's okay with everybody. And definitely gonna go back and read the chat. <laughs> Um, so it was just really touching on Tawana's point and Dana's and Jacinta's and thank you, Tim, as well. Um, just that point about, you know, my, minorities, Global South, BIPOC people in your school. You, I think one of the things that sometimes you forget is that they have spent a lifetime not seeing themselves in those positions, not being considered for those positions and not considering themselves for those positions. So it takes more than just allowing the application or you know, it, there, I think there does need to be some kind of intentional coaching, a recognition of when you see leadership potential to raise that to these people's awareness so that they, because we just don't think of ourselves in those roles. We don't see ourselves. We've never been coached, mentored, managed by these kind of people. And the daily pushback that you get as a person of color when you bring up issues of DEIJ, when you think about scaling that up to leadership, it's terrifying. So just something else to think about, you know, if you are leaders and managers and you, you know, you see that people, you, cause I, you know, sometimes you hear well, they didn't apply. So what am I supposed to do? You're supposed to approach them and encourage them and show them that they can be in those spaces as well. Very important, yeah. Very, thank you, amazing. Okay, I don't want to cut this off is that I think, um, Okay, anybody, uh, last call, <laughs> last call for any comment um, or thought before we go. And, and it's very important to know. 
I'll just do a very quick one on a good note. I think that we've all had experiences um, that put us in these spaces of sadness of, and they are personal or they are observed. Um, I will just tell you that in, in my case, I lived um, a sit situations of that white supremacy and, and male leadership not giving the opportunity, but then there was a courageous woman um, that said, this is not okay and could have lost her job for placing me in a position and did that. It's not easy, it is possible. And you know we need a lot of that courage and thank you Homer for moving us in that direction of courage. Yes, wow. Everybody, thanks so much. Uh, hey Homer, you did a, just a terrific job of, of setting up this conversation as the fact that we would like to go longer than 60 minutes proves. Uh, thank you so much. And um, and again, I just want to let you know that that Kevin Bartlett was not able to be here today because he is working on a school, working with a school in a seminar set setting. So he gives his regrets. And lastly, um, I can't thank you enough, all of you who have joined as newbies to this conversation as well. And what we all would be carrying away is we need you. So let's keep stay in the fold and make sure that we join together again next Friday to continue this discussion. Uh, really looking forward to, to the leadership of many of you who will be part of, of the discussion for next Friday. So um, yeah, I read, in the, I read in the chat that maybe there's something not so good about this being our final uh, principle. And I get that and I, I don't know, I don't want to be glib, but I do think that we've maybe saved the most important for last because it helps us to see how important it is and how global this issue is to any other principle that we might talk about. Uh, please don't let, let that sound convenient. I'm actually serious when I say that. So that being done and said at this point, um, let's gather next Friday. Uh, try to bring three or four other people along with you. Let's try to widen the horizon of this discussion and again, I'm so grateful to you, Homa, uh, Will, so grateful to everybody who joined in the conversation today. And isn't it true? Come on now. We learn through conversation. We just proved it once again. So everybody, thank you so much. And be safe out there. Thank Cheers, you, everybody. Everyone. Come back next week. Yeah. Thank you all. And thanks for the curators who are teeing us up. They already have amazing stuff set up. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. Take care. Thank you so much for your contributions today.